It's time for another warm-up review. Let's get going. What drugs are known to inhibit cytochrome P450? So the mnemonic for this was crack amigos. So we have ciprofloxacin, ritonavir, which is a protease inhibitor, amiodarone, cimetidine, ketoconazole, acute alcohol use, macrolides, isoniazid, grapefruit juice, omeprazole, and then finally sulfonamides. Next, what is a disulfiram-like reaction? So a disulfiram-like reaction is where you have an inhibition of acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So alcohol can't be fully metabolized. So you have accumulation of acetaldehyde and that causes flushing, sweating, nausea, headache, and hypotension. Next, what drugs cause a disulfiram-like reaction? So the drugs that cause this reaction are gonna include metronidazole, and then certain cephalosporins, not all of them, but cefotetam, uh, cefmandol, and then cefepirazone. And then also the first generation sulfonylureas, things like uh, tolbutamide. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. In this video, we're going to talk about the physiology of congestive heart failure, or CHF. So let's start by thinking about the pressures in the heart. The heart's number one job is pumping blood. So heart failure is essentially pump failure. Now, when a pump fails, the pressure of the fluid going forward drops way down, and the pressure rises in the system feeding into the pump because that fluid's backing up. So the left ventricle is responsible for pumping blood out to the body, and if the left ventricle starts to fail, the pressure in the aorta tends to fall, and as the blood backs up into the left atrium, the left atrial pressure rises. We use something called the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to estimate the pressure in the left atrium. So how do we measure the wedge pressure? We measure it with a Swan-Gans catheter. A Swan-Gans catheter is a venous catheter that's put into either the internal jugular vein or the subclavian vein. Now the catheter is wired through the superior vena cava and then into the right atrium, and then it continues through the right ventricle. And there's a little balloon on the end of the catheter, and when you inflate the balloon, it kind of drifts along with the blood flow circulating through the heart, and the balloon and the catheter float down through the heart. So this inflated balloon goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle and then into the pulmonary artery. And in the pulmonary artery, it continues until it can't go any farther. At the point where it stops, it's been wedged into one of the small branches of the pulmonary artery. At that point, you have what's called a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. You've wedged that balloon into a branch of the pulmonary artery. And there's a pressure sensing device in the tip of the Swan-Gans catheter just beyond the balloon so that when the balloon's inflated, you can measure the pressure distal to the balloon. That pressure is not coming from the right side of the heart because your balloon's inflated and you've blocked the right side of the heart from contributing anything to that pressure. You basically created a little balloon embolus with the Swan-Gans catheter. So what pressure are you measuring just distal to the balloon? Well, you're measuring the pressure in the left atrium. The wedge pressure is an approximation of the left atrial pressure, which is generally also a good approximation of the left ventricular diastolic pressure. Now, a normal wedge pressure is less than 12 millimeters mercury and the left atrial pressure is less than 12, and the le left ventricular diastolic pressure is around 10. So if you want to know what's going on in the left side of the heart, a Swan-Gans catheter can measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and help determine what's going on. Now, in a patient with mitral stenosis, the wedge pressure is higher than the left ventricular diastolic pressure. So think about it. The mitral valve is stenosed or narrowed. So during diastole, when the mitral valve should be open, and the left atrium is contracting, the left atrium is contracting against a partially closed mitral valve, so the pressure inside the atrium is going to rise. The blood has nowhere to go, so the pressure rises. And since the wedge pressure is roughly equal to the left atrial pressure, the wedge pressure will rise also, and the wedge pressure will be higher than the left ventricular diastolic pressure. Now we're ready to talk about heart failure and the physiology of heart failure. Heart failure is not a disease in and of itself. Heart failure is a clinical syndrome, a constellation of signs and symptoms that you find in patients who have abnormal cardiac structure or abnormal cardiac function. So this could be an acquired abnormality, such as ischemic heart disease or toxic damage from drugs or myocarditis, or it could be an inherited disorder. But regardless of the underlying cause, heart failure patients have this syndrome of findings, including things like exercise intolerance and fatigue, shortness of breath, pulmonary rawls or crackles when you listen to the lungs, and peripheral edema. So where do all these signs and symptoms come from? Well, let's look at this busy diagram in the study guide. There's a lot going on here, so let's go through it step by step. On the far left, it starts out with decreased left ventricular contractility. That's pump failure. You have pump failure because the heart isn't contracting as efficiently. And what causes decreased left ventricular contractility? 
Well, the two most common causes are chronic hypertension and ischemic heart disease, including myocardial infarction. So we call this ischemic cardiomyopathy. But chronic hypertension is probably the most common cause. Chronic hypertension leads to left ventricular hypertrophy because the left ventricle has to work harder to pump blood against all that increased blood pressure. So the myocardium becomes thicker. It becomes hypertrophied. And left ventricular hypertrophy becomes heart failure. So you start out with decreased left ventricular contractility, which causes two things, decreased cardiac output and pulmonary venous congestion. We'll come back to that one. Let's focus on cardiac output for the moment. Low cardiac output will decrease the blood pressure. That makes sense. And the body wants to counteract that. It wants to compensate for that low cardiac output. The body's main goal is to get the cardiac output back up somewhat. That's what we see on the top right. The body's trying to compensate for low cardiac output by doing whatever it can to increase cardiac output. So keep that goal in mind. Now there are two main ways that the body tries to compensate for low cardiac output. By activating the sympathetic nervous system and by activating the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And it's not one or the other. You know, the body's going to do both of these. And we're going to see that both of these compensatory mechanisms do work. They do get the cardiac output back up somewhat, but they also have negative consequences, as we're going to see. So let's look at sympathetic activation first, following along that top row. You have decreased cardiac output, leading to activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, this is a short-term mechanism to regulate the blood pressure. Your carotid sinus senses that decreased pressure and increases its sympathetic outflow, which increases left ventricular contractility, which is a good thing. That's going to increase cardiac output, but again, that's sort of a short-term fix. The other big compensatory mechanism is to activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Let's pause our discussion of CHF for just a moment and review the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So it starts with renin, which is an enzyme made in the kidneys. And there are several things that stimulate renin production. One is the sympathetic nervous system, stimulating beta-1 receptors on the kidneys. And that tells the kidneys to secrete more renin. We see that on the diagram. The dashed line shows that sympathetic activation also activates the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. A second way to stimulate renin production is that the macula densa cells in the kidney can sense reduced sodium in the glomerular filtrate. And the third way, which is the important one for us right now, talking about CHF and decreased cardiac output, the third mechanism is that the juxtaglomerular apparatus in the kidney senses the blood pressure. When the juxtaglomerular apparatus senses low blood pressure, it tells the kidney to secrete more renin. Then, what does renin do? Well, renin is an enzyme that cleaves angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Then we need to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. What enzyme does that? Well, it's called angiotensin converting enzyme, which is produced in the lungs as well as in the kidneys. So we've already seen three different organ systems involved in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The kidneys are making renin, the liver is making angiotensinogen, and the lungs are making angiotensin converting enzyme. So angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And then angiotensin II has several actions, but the two most important actions are, first of all, angiotensin tenses angios. It's a vasoconstrictor. It's the most potent vasoconstrictor in the human body. It acts on the angiotensin receptors on vascular smooth muscle cells, and that causes vasoconstriction, and that raises the blood pressure. And the second important action of angiotensin II is that it stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete aldosterone, which comes from the adrenal cortex and the zona glomerulosa. So that's a fourth organ involved here, the adrenal gland, making aldosterone. And the downstream effect of aldosterone is that it stimulates the reabsorption of sodium and water in the kidney. So angiotensin directly raises the blood pressure through vasoconstriction, and it also indirectly raises the blood pressure by expanding the intravascular volume through secretion of aldosterone and increased sodium and water retention. That's more of a long-term response to low blood pressure. So going back to our diagram, we said that decreased cardiac output and low blood pressure will stimulate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So you're going to retain sodium and water, and that increases your systemic venous pressure and increases preload, which is going to help to increase cardiac output. So again, the body's doing all this in an effort to compensate for the left ventricular dysfunction. That's what you want to happen. Unfortunately, the increased fluid and increased venous pressure will also lead to peripheral edema. So the box at the top right, increased cardiac output, that's the positive effect we're trying to achieve. The two boxes on the bottom right are negative, unintended consequences of all these compensatory mechanisms. That peripheral edema is sort of an unfortunate side effect. Then going back to the beginning on the far left, we said that decreased left ventricular contractility has two effects. Not only does pump failure affect the fluid going forward, which is decreased cardiac output, 
but it also affects the fluid coming in. So as blood backs up, you get pulmonary venous congestion. The blood backs up from the left ventricle into the pulmonary veins, which is going to result in a decreased right ventricular output. So decreased left ventricular contractility eventually leads to decreased right ventricular output. I'm sure you've heard this before. What's the most common cause of right-sided heart failure? Left-sided heart failure. You can hear that again and again throughout your training. With left-sided heart failure, you end up increasing the afterload on the right side of the heart as you congest the pulmonary vasculature. And then that contributes to the peripheral edema because systemic venous pressure is higher and the fluid in the venous system backs up and then weeps out of the circulation into the tissues. But the pulmonary congestion and the left-sided heart failure also cause pulmonary edema. Now that you understand the physiology of heart failure, let's review what CHF looks like clinically. There are two broad categories of CHF symptoms and two different types of heart failure. There's left-sided heart failure, which causes pulmonary edema and rawls and dyspnea, and there's right-sided heart failure, which tends to cause more of the peripheral symptoms like peripheral edema and JVD. So left-sided heart failure can lead to dyspnea or shortness of breath on exertion because the left ventricle output fails to increase during exercise. So of course that fluid is going to back up into the pulmonary vasculature and you have dyspnea on exertion. You're commonly going to see that abbreviated DOE, dyspnea on exertion. Left-sided heart failure can also cause cardiac dilation because you have a greater ventricular end diastolic volume. So the heart just gets bigger and bigger over time, kind of like you're blowing up a balloon. Left-sided heart failure can also lead to pulmonary edema, as we discussed. And you can have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, where the patient wakes up at night gasping for breath. And you can also have orthopnea, where the patient gets short of breath when lying down, but then it gets better when he or she sits up. So all of those symptoms are due to left-sided heart failure. When you see pulmonary symptoms in heart failure, think left-sided heart failure. L for left and L for lungs. Now, what about right-sided heart failure? Well, we mentioned peripheral edema. There's pedal edema, which is edema in the ankles and the legs. There's also presacral edema, where you press on the skin overlying the sacrum, and you can make a nice thumbprint because of the pitting edema. You basically have increased venous pressure, which means more back pressure on the capillaries and more leakage of fluid out of the capillaries into the interstitium. You can also see jugular venous distension because of increased central venous pressure. And then right side of failure can also cause hepatic congestion. So if the right side of the heart fails, uh, blood's going to back up into the inferior vena cava and backs up into the liver. And you can get hepatic congestion and hepatomegaly. Now on biopsy or autopsy, the liver looks mottled. It looks something like a nutmeg seed, which you've probably never seen, but they call this nutmeg liver. Chronic passive congestion of the liver due to right-sided heart failure. So left-sided heart failure causes the lung signs and symptoms. Right-sided heart failure causes signs and symptoms affecting the rest of the body. So R for right and R for the rest of the body. One other thing I want to mention briefly as we're talking about the signs and symptoms of heart failure is a lab test that's often useful, which is called BNP. BNP stands for either B-type natriuretic peptide, or sometimes it's called brain natriuretic peptide. But BNP is a hormone produced in the cells of the cardiac ventricles in response to ventricular stretch. And it does two things. It causes vasodilation, and it's also a natriuretic peptide. It causes increased excretion of sodium and water in the urine. So it's a diuretic hormone. So when the left ventricle is failing and the end diastolic volume rises and the ventricles start to stretch, the, those myocytes secrete BNP, and the BNP causes a little diuresis and a little vasodilation. And both of those effects will lower the preload and take some of the strain off the heart. Now we can actually measure serum levels of BNP in order to help diagnose CHF. In general, if the BNP is less than 100, that's not CHF. If the BNP is greater than 400, that most likely is CHF. And a BNP of 100 to 400 is indeterminate. It's not really reliable all by itself. So a BNP might show up on your exam as a lab result that they give you to steer you toward one diagnosis or another. So say a patient comes to the ER short of breath, and he has a history of both CHF and COPD. Well, you've got to make a correct diagnosis so you can treat the patient appropriately. Does he need albuterol for COPD, which is going to make his heart work harder? Or does he need to be treated for CHF? So it's extremely important to make the correct diagnosis. Possibly he's got a chest x-ray that's kind of hazy looking. You're not sure if he has some pulmonary edema from CHF or maybe he has some atypical interstitial pneumonia. So you've got to be able to make a correct diagnosis. So in addition to taking a careful history and doing a good physical exam, one test you can order is a serum BNP level. All right, that's it for now. We're going to talk about how we treat CHF in the next video. But first, let's go ahead and do the end of session quiz.
First question, what are the signs of right-sided heart failure? So right-sided heart failure is going to have peripheral signs and symptoms. Remember the rest of the body, such as lower extremity edema, jugular venous distension, and possibly hepatosplenomegaly or nutmeg liver. Next, what are the signs of left-sided heart failure? So left-sided heart failure is going to cause pulmonary symptoms. Remember L for left and L for lungs. So you can see pulmonary symptoms like dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and possibly pulmonary edema and Rawls on physical exam. And the last question, how does poor cardiac output result in an increase in aldosterone? So decreased cardiac output leads to low blood pressure, which is then detected by the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney. And these cells then secrete renin, which activates the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which ultimately increases aldosterone levels. And that's it for now. I'll see you next time.